Welcome to Newsnight. I'm Trevor MacDonald, and for more than 30 years now, I've been presenting the news. Yes, that's where you've seen me before. <laughs> in three turbulent decades, I've interviewed some of the most powerful politicians in the world. Nelson Mandela, George Bush, and Tony Blair, to name but two. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to keep up with an ever-changing world. For instance, in my day, Paul Potts was a Cambodian dictator. <laughs> in all that time, I've had to treat the news with great respect. But now, with the knighthood safely in the bag, I can say what I damn well please. <laughs> Because this is the news bulletin I've always wanted to present. So, coming up tonight, as poor ratings continue on Channel 4's Big Brother, questions are asked about the quality of this year's housemates. They're horrible. They're not, they're quite cute. They are not. They're, Noses and whiskers. They are, they are vermin. <laughs> as he rebuilds his shattered reputation, quiz cheat Charles Ingram has gone out and bought himself a dog. And after failing to win Britain's Got Talent, things go from bad to worse for six-year-old Connie Talbot at the after-show party. <laughs> <laughs> Providing expert analysis of the major news stories of the past seven days are my news team, Marcus Brigstock, Reginald D. Hunter and Clive Anderson. This is the show where I set the news agenda and where every week we'll discuss my top three stories. So, straight in at number three, it's the government announcement that up to 25,000 criminals are to be released early in a bid to ease overcrowding in Britain's prisons. Well, they've got to make some room somehow for Tony Blair and his friends. <laughs> some of the prisoners eligible for release have been convicted of drug-related offences, something about which the Conservative leader David Cameron has been accused of taking a soft line. When younger, lots of people do things that they shouldn't do. I was one of them, and I reject those things. Uh, but I think people should judge me now. And the policies we've put forward, and we've said very clearly, let's have more in terms of drugs education in our schools. Let's make sure that we get ex-addicts who've been to hell and back and get them to talk to children about the dangers of drug taking. And let's have better treatment programs. <laughs> Marcus Brigstock, you've been taking a close look at the prison crisis. What do you make of this extraordinary situation? Well, it is very strange because just six weeks ago, uh, Justice Min Minister Lord Faulkner went on the record and he said this. I'm not going to announce early releases because of prison overcrowding. Any early releases? Any early releases, no. So it's not just a number, it's simply wrong? It's simply, simply wrong. Since then, there has been a, a small shift in the government's... <laughs> a tiny, tiny Well, shift. there's been a... It's, it's subtle, but it, it, uh, basically, <laughs> from what he said there, that no prisoners would be released, they're now releasing 25,000... <laughs> ..for ten years. Everyone's been saying, well, prisons are getting full, prisons are getting full, and they've basically taken the same approach to it as I take to my kitchen bin. Yeah. <laughs> they just go, yeah, that'll be all right. Another couple of spaghetti hoop tins, we'll just... <laughs> Drive it down. But they, Why don't they... we go back to the old days when we had Australia to put them in? That worked. That... <laughs> exactly. That's, that's not full yet, is it? There's no. some great open areas. <laughs> don't you worry, but a rack is going to be very empty soon. <laughs> <It's cold>. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the reason, Sir Trev, that uh, there's so many. <laughs> It's either Sir Trevor or Trev. Yeah, I, I feel we're he can say whatever now. he likes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. T. Yeah. <laughs> If anyone offers you milk and you wake up on a plane, you'll know that that's... <laughs> I've been in the food and tried to make me host a show. <laughs> but, no, the, 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 a lot of the reason why there's so many people in prison is because since New Labour came into power, they have introduced a new piece of legislation for every single day that they've been in power. Uh, I mean, some of, them are, some of them are quite good. Did you know it's now illegal to cause a nuclear explosion? <laughs> That that's a good law. That's a, that that hasn't, a good law. There hasn't been a nuclear explosion since they brought that law in. <laughs> that that's is really good effective. Uh, Neighbourhood Watch, that is. Sort of yeah, difference. curtain twitches. Yeah. Oh, he's got yeah. a trident, hasn't yeah. he? <laughs> uh, 
it's illegal to enter the hull of the Titanic without the express permission of the Secretary of State. <laughs> that's, uh, that's just a euphemism. That's, that's gay. <laughs> oh, is it? It's, it's gay slang, I think you'll yeah. find. How it. it. <laughs> come you so clued up on <laughs> There's the, um, the scallop fishing order of 2004. I mean, imagine, imagine checking into your cell with a bloke who goes, right, what are you in for? I'm in for mugging and GBH. Well, I was fishing for scallops. Mm. <laughs> Unless that's another euphemism. <laughs> um, <laughs> also on the subject of crime this week, Nick Ross says he's lost his job to make way for a younger presenter. Is that really true? Find out next week on Crime Watch with Trevor McDonald. <laughs> oh, well. Well, now it's time for gay or blind. Now you may think. <laughs> <laughs> now stay with me on this one. You may think it's easy to distinguish between someone like this and someone like this. <laughs> But you'd be terribly wrong. We're going to interview Eric Weihenmayer, who climbed the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. But he's gay. I mean, he's gay, excuse me, he's blind. <laughs> so we'll hear about that. Now, that was obviously a Freudian slip. But it does appear that Freudian slips by amateurish news presenters are an occupational hazard. J-Lo's new song, Jenny from the Block, all about Lopez roots, about how she's still a neighborhood gal at heart. But folks from that street in New York, the Bronx section, sound more likely to give her a curb job than a blow job, or blo block party. <laughs> the New York Post, we're sorry about that slip up there. I have no idea how that happened. That happened I'm kind of curious about what a, what a curb job feels like. <laughs> It's like a blowjob, only three inches taller. That's oh. it. <laughs> it's time now for the second of my top three stories of the week. It's the marking of British summertime with the traditional mud fest that is Glastonbury. I can't remember the last time I went to Glastonbury, but then again, that's mushrooms for you. <laughs> Reginald, what do you make of this strange desire to pitch a tent in a muddy field? What does that tell you about British culture, life in this country? That people in this country like to get drunk and high everywhere, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, under any circumstances. Uh, let's face it, British people, y'all drink the way Americans eat. So, uh, <laughs> the, a whole nation of people who, before you go out for an evening of drink, you have a drink. I mean... <laughs> Which bit of America do you come from? I come from Georgia. Georgia and that's, that's a hot part of the world, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't dream of going out and camping and listening to music anyway if, if it was going to be raining the way it does over here? I would go and spend the day doing that, but I need, like, a nice hotel to go to after. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a place I could take a shower and stuff. Yeah. Or, you know, like, if I m happen to meet some nice, pretty, stone young woman. Yeah. <laughs> We got somewhere comfortable to be, man, you yeah. know? I mean, you know, singing and music in the field. You know, black people kind of got over that a couple of hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it don't, don't mean nothing to us to be out there in the field singing and stuff like that, man. Well, so. Marcus, you, you're probably a regular at uh, festivals, are you? I am, very much so. The problem we've got here, Clive, is that we're recording this now, and immediately after this I'll go to Glastonbury, but this will go out after I've been. Oh, so my, head. To, oh know, my head's spinning I know, we need to We need to record some versions of sort of things yeah. that might have happened. You were arrested at Glastonbury this That's year. That's right, I was. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was shortly yeah. after Amy Winehouse and I attempted to surf on Shirley Bassey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave here and when this go out, what are you, Doctor Who? What? <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, the British summer isn't all about Glastonbury. This week, we've had Ascot too, And for the first time in 300 years, anyone could buy their way into the royal enclosure. Anyone, that is, with £740 to spare. So that means you and me, then, Clive. <laughs> um, <laughs> not... not... Um, uh, is, that, is that an offer of a date? Or is that... <laughs> Tre Trevor and Clive, we do sound like a pair of hairdressers. It does <laughs> 
<laughs> I can see it now. Uh oh. <laughs> I feel another euphemism about to come. <laughs> is is Ascot then more your thing, Reg? Not Glastonbury, but Ascot. Would that be yeah, more yeah, your thing? Yeah, I, 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 I like Ascot because it's, it's, you know, uh, horses and, um, and, and grass. <laughs> and um, uh, I know as an American, I love it because the Queen go to the Ascot. And we love the Queen because we don't pay for her. And um, <laughs> um, I like to show a graphic because there's a lot of betting that go on at the Ascot. Um, and there's a lot of betting going on what the Queen will wear. Now, you see this, you know, she wear cream and beige or she wear white or, or you know, she wear a baseball cap. <laughs> Everyone knows the Queen likes a bet. <laughs> you say we pay for it, she can pay for the entire monarchy every year by just putting Windsor Castle on cream and beige and remembering to wear cream and beige. That's, that's all she's going to do. She could do that, yeah. but she ain't. <laughs> she's funny like that. She, yeah, she, she what are you? Hang on, you've just arrived here. You're an expert on the Queen. Yeah, I know yeah. about the Queen. What? Well, I, I ain't supposed to know about the Queen now. Well, a minute ago, you, you were asked to describe Ascot and you said it was got horses and grass. It did. That it was... It was... <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I don't want to talk to you no more. You just confirm my point. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. Coming up yeah. on Newsnight, a tragic story from BBC's Spring Watch as the crew prepared for an end-of-series barbecue and Sammy the Hedgehog chose the wrong place to hide. <laughs> Welcome back to Newsnight. The latest headlines now. He settled his differences with the new regime at 10 Downing Street, so in Brussels, it's time for Peter Mandelson to call in the removal men and move back to Britain. <laughs> in other news, Britain's postal workers have announced that next Friday we'll see the first postal strike in a decade. That's right, what you're currently experiencing is normal service. <laughs> So then, a national postal strike, whatever will we do? Send an email. Well, that's that sorted then. <laughs> this is Newsnight, the show where I set the news agenda, assisted by my news team, Marcus Brigstock, Reginald D. Hunter and Clive Anderson. So, which news stories have particularly interested you this last week? Well, Sir Trevor, they've decided to give Salman Rushdie a knighthood and it seems to have upset one or two people uh, in Pakistan and Iran. Um, I, I, I don't think we should be afraid. I think this is something we should just approach head on while we still have <laughs> a, uh, a, a head on. But yeah, they've, <laughs> they've given him a knighthood and people are up in arms, presumably without having realised that a knighthood is basically worth bugger all. <laughs> um, Oh, no, I've said entirely the wrong thing. New show. Uh, so... You probably said entirely the right thing. You never know. Well, I'll ask you. How, where, how did you get yours, Sir Trev? I have absolutely no idea why I was given mine. Um... Well, ne neither have we. <laughs> uh... I thought you'd say that. We're pleased, but, you know. Oh, thank you so much. You didn't have, like, no fatua put on you like Salman Rushdie did, right? Because Salman Rushdie, he had a fatua put on him. But just after he got his fatua... I mean, I saw him in magazines and penthouses with coked up holes and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I, I want a factual. I want a factual. <laughs> I'm going to write me a book. I'm going to write a book called Allah, the Koran, and Your Mama. <laughs> <laughs> See what that gives me. <laughs> We're not with him. <laughs> it's it's very, I mean, they're pr properly angry. The students in uh, Pakistan have been going berserk. They've been uh, burning flags and, uh, and effigies and all the rest of it. And you look at it and you think, that seems a bit extreme. But then you look at British students and think, it'd be nice if they were that highly motivated. <laughs> <laughs> why? Do, why? Do we know why he's been given a night? Because there's not, no absolute necessity to give a night. I mean, this is going to happen, wasn't it? This Are you implying to... that there might be something sinister in this... Uh... Gift of a knighthood? They say, oh, no, let's do that. Uh, that's not going to cause any trouble, is it? There's nowhere in the world that would be annoyed by that. Uh, this won't harm international relations. Or, uh, they, they swallowed the Iraq war. They won't mind us uh, getting out of there. <laughs> what, what's against it? Well, I, I don't know. I, I know what's for it. I'm going to Islamabad and opening a flag and match shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But I mean, is your, it, has it made a big difference to you being a being a knight? I mean, you got this show. <laughs> uh, do they still do that thing with the sword? Do they, do, or... I, I'm afraid so. Yeah. The great problem is with the state of my knees is bending down and getting back up again. <laughs> yeah. I think Salman would be quite worried about the thing with the sword. <laughs> <laughs> If I was him, I wouldn't go. Yeah. <laughs> One and a half billion Muslims have condemned the decision to give a knighthood to the author Salman Rushdie. I know just how he feels. When I got mine, Michael Aspel protested for days. Or as I now call him, Mr. Michael Aspel. <laughs> it's time now for Racist and Dead. <laughs> <laughs> this week is the turn of corpulent, narrow-minded northerner Bernard Manning. Personally, I never thought of Bernard Manning as a racist comic, just a fat white bastard. <laughs> now, according, according to Frank Carson, people that misunderstood him didn't have a sense of humour. <laughs> Irish comedian Carson added that every time he walked into a room, Bernard Manning would say, Can anyone smell Semtex? <laughs> Although, to be fair, Frank Carson does reek of Semtex. <laughs> Sorry, Frank, only, only joking. <laughs> and now on to Saudis do the funniest things. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> what now? Because now, now we've started on racist bird and we may as yes, well keep the thing. <laughs> <joining. laughs> no, 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 you're kicking a man when he's down and dead. You're nicking his axe. <laughs> Two Saudi lads walk into a bar. <laughs> Great dirty bastard Arabs. I'm not racist, this is just a bit of fun. <laughs> Saudi Arabia has a reputation for being a harsh and repressive fundamentalist society. But it's not all stonings and public beheadings. There's a lighter side to life, too. <laughs> Take a look at how these youngsters liven up a boring car journey on the 2,000 mile gap between service stations. The big question is, where did they get those sandals? <laughs> my Birkenstocks would be torn to shreds if I tried that. <laughs> well, it's time for my number one story of the week, and it's the continuation of Tony Blair's long goodbye. In the last ten years, Mr Blair's had a really tough time from the press, but never has he had to face criticism like this. The first time I saw you. Everybody else thought you were a revolting human being, and I thought you were quite funny. Now I realise I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I don't think it needs to get personal, no, Piers, but I, I just think that the... It, I never liked the act in the first place. I was quite clear about that. It, it's no disrespect to you, it's just not my cup of tea. I don't, definitely don't think it's the Queen's cup of tea. <laughs> Tony, Tony, Tony. Well, um, <laughs> as Peter said, it was a very uncomfortable act, probably one of the worst I have ever seen. <laughs> Overall, I think it was a complete and utter mess. Well, Mr Blair's been in Europe this week for negotiations over a new EU treaty. Critics warned that the proposed treaty would hand over British powers to Europe. Although, first, we'd have to get them back from America. <laughs> <laughs> Clive, you're a very keen observer of Tony Blair's career. There's been a sort of leaving do at, at, at Downing yes. Street. He, I mean, he's, he's been popular in the, the Labour Party until fairly recently, but he's a bit like, it's a bit like a dinner party, when you've thrown a dinner party and it's a bit late, you want to go to bed, and he just won't go. Basically, it's like a horror movie. It's like, you know, he dead, he dead. No, he not. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the right way for him to bow out with a big row with some foreigners in Europe? Poland have been the, most, uh, the, the best fun at this particular conference. They've said, uh, OK, we're, we're, there's only 38 million of us, so we only have so many votes. But we should have more because we were rather cut down a bit during 1939 to 1945, <laughs> not to mention the war. But it's being hosted in Germany, isn't it? Mm. So that's definitely the right thing to mention, you know, yeah. at the beginning of negotiations. I think that's a good... Uh, and Sorry, it, more of us yeah. would have been here, but you killed us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of upping the ante. Yeah. Well, at the final Cabinet meeting, Jack Straw told Tony Blair that he'd always be remembered for Northern Ireland, the 2012 Olympics and civil partnerships. So, presumably, if you're a gay sprinter from Belfast, he's the best Prime Minister ever. Yeah. Well, if you're gay in Belfast, you tend to be quite a good uh, sprinter, but... Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much for that. 
but now back to me again. We move now to Planet Stupid. Because let's face it, stupid people are everywhere and ever willing to get themselves into the news. It's something of a global problem. So where in the world have people been doing spectacularly stupid things this week? Marcus, where are you taking us now? Uh, to China, a place called Yangqi. And uh, two officials there have been jailed for allowing a blind man to design a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, collapsed during the construction. No one could have seen that coming. <laughs> Especially him. Particularly him, yeah. <laughs> What is the backstory to that? How does that arise? Actually, he won the opportunity to uh, design the bridge in a competition called Blind or Gay. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not... He's the guy, actually, the guy who, who did it is, is doing all right, cos he's designed this. <laughs> well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you to my news team, Marcus Brigstock, Reginald D. Hunter and Clive Anderson. Join us next week for our exclusive report into the growing bitchiness between BBC employees. That's not Anne Robinson, is it? Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> She's even got new tits. <laughs> you see, we're not all as nice as we pretend to be. Good night. <laughs>